you would, guys, turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. And um, we have a, a body of scripture that Sean has given us. Sally asked me this morning, um, are you going to read the whole passage? And I said, no, it's too long. It's like four chapters. And so uh, we're going to be just reading sections of this as we go through this. But um, you have your handouts that I've prepared for you, so I want to encourage you to uh, pick up a handout. There's more handouts on this table if anybody needs one, so you can have that and take that, and this will be a summary of everything that we're talking about today. Um, you know, as, as we begin to kick into this, uh, on page one, I've given you uh, the Lord's Prayer, and it's good for us to be reminded who we are, and it's good for us to be reminded what God is actually calling us um, to uh, what's he, what he's actually calling us to engage in. What are, what are those things that we're to be about? And I just want to remind you what, what the Lord's Prayer says. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, gentlemen, I, I love this phrase because this statement is a summary of everything that we ought to be about over the course of our earthly days. That our chief concern is simply this. Whatever is happening in heaven, that's the very thing that we want to happen on earth. Now, I want you to know at the outset that I actually believe in a sovereign God who sits on a throne in a throne room. I actually believe there is a throne room. I actually believe Jesus is the Lord of history. I actually believe that um, we've, we've been given not only the gift of the gospel, but that we've been given the third person of the Trinity, and the third person of the, of the Trinity offers to us an enabling power so that we can actually live out the Christian life. And as all that is true... Our hope, and this should be your hope today as you're moving through your day and going to work and later on tonight when the temperature drops, Mike told me uh, the other day, the temperature's going to drop like 50 degrees today, something like that. It's just bizarre, isn't it? Um, but as you go home tonight, our chief concern is this. Lord, whatever is happening in heaven, I want that to happen on earth. Would you pray that today? Because that is most pertinent to our passage this morning. I've given you two scriptures, one in Ephesians 3, I want to read that to you, and then another in Acts 1. And these two passages talk to us about the power that we've been given to do the very thing that God has called us to do. Verse 19 of Ephesians 3, And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, now to him who is able to do, a, a, uh, to do far more abundantly uh, all that we ask or think, according to uh, the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. It's a fabulous verse in verse 20. To him who is able that God is the one who is actually able to do for us far more than we can even possibly imagine, and that, that His power is at work in us, and this power is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, is the power that you have coursing through your veins in this moment. That's what that word means. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is the power that you have in your life right now. And then look at Acts 1.8. And you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and even to the very ends of the earth. And once again, there is the promise of power. And, and so I want to ask you a question at the very top of our study this morning. What is your greatest need in this moment in your life? It is the power of the Holy Spirit in your life that is an enabling power 
so that you will engage in those things that are ultimately important to a sovereign father. I think oftentimes we live as if there is no Holy Spirit. We live as if there is no gospel. And because we have been sucked into um, a very polarized and, and secularized society, but these passages are telling us just the opposite. And notice the quote that I have for you from Jonathan Edwards at the bottom of page one. The seeking of the kingdom uh, of God is the chief business of the Christian life. Um, I've <clears throat> and he, he goes on and says, I believe you would agree that this is a striking statement that really should inform the trajectory of our lives. Now, dear friends, you can go to page two if you want to. Um, I, I say all this because what we're talking about this morning are divisions within the church. What we're talking about this morning is polarization within the body of Christ. And the evil one loves it when there's division and polarization because it ruins our witness before a lost and dying world. You know, we remember what the, uh, what the Lord said in John 13, uh, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The greatest apologetic that we have is how we treat one another, how we love one another, how we radically love one another in the same way that the Father has radically loved us. And the world is watching us, seeing if we're going to love one another in that way. Church history tells us um, <clears throat> informs us that the Apostle John was the last apostle to step into heaven. And here's the great theologian John, and he's circled with his disciples, and, uh, and he's, he's giving them his last earthly words. And what would be those words that would come out of the great theologian John? And he would say, love one another. Please, just love one another. Dear friends, why do people leave the church? Why do Christians leave the church? Because of the Christians in the church. You realize that? And when that happens, do you realize how we ruin our witness before a lost and dying world? And they look at us and they say, they're no different than we are. Now, in light of that, let's look at several passages and then we're going to dig into what I think is the central theme of these three and a half chapters, which is our union with Christ. We'll talk about our union with Christ just for a moment, and then we're going to flesh out uh, some application. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 13, will be the first passage I read, and then 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 4. Follow along with me as I read, would you? 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 13. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all, <clears throat> that all of you agree and that there are no divisions among you and that you being united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Cleo, Cleo's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each of you says, I follow Paul or I follow Apollos or I follow Cephas or I follow Christ. Verse 13, is Christ divided? You see what's happening in this passage that Paul gives to us? He says, um, he says I, I appeal to you that there would be no divisions among you. And he continues, he says, I, I want you united in the same mind and in the same judgment. This was a subject that was incredibly important to Paul because of the witness of the church. But then look also in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 4. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 4. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food. For you were not ready for it. 
And even now you are uh, not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh? And listen to this phrase. Are you not of the flesh? Behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, Apollos, are you not being merely human? And and this is setting the, the tone of the church at Corinth. That there was jealousy, there was strife, there was anguish, and and Paul, in his wisdom, God, in, in, as he gives the, the mystery of his revelation, he dedicates a number of chapters because this is so very important for us because the world is watching us and they want to know if Jesus is real. We read about that in, 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 in the Gospel of John. where it, It's just repeated over and over again. Um, The world is watching us. They want to see our love. They want to see our unity. They want to see if Jesus is real. And Jesus actually testifies to that very thing, to that very truth. And so the the premise that I have for you this morning uh, is is a rather simple one. And, And that is that if we have a proper perspective of who we are in Jesus, And at this point, we're talking about our union with Christ, which Paul talks about in this passage. If we have a proper perspective of who we are, then we will not tend towards divisiveness and argumentation when it comes to the body of Christ. But if we don't know who we are, we're fleshly, we're immature, and our tendency is going to be to argue and to fight and to divide the body by saying, I'm a Paulist or I'm a Paul. And so, brothers, you're going to have to ask yourselves, as I've wrestled this passage since last Friday, you know, um, do I understand my union with Christ? Do I understand what, what the church is all about? Do I understand that my goal in life, that is whatever's happening in the throne room of, of God, whatever's happening in heaven, I want that to happen here on earth. Is this your chief motive? And that's what I'm going to be talking with us about today. Look in 1 Corinthians 1.30, would you? Because this is a passage that deals with our union in Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.30. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that as it is written notice the fruit of this <laughs> when we are in Christ uh, we, we, we begin to gain the wisdom of God the righteousness of God the sanctification of God the redemption of God but notice verse 31 when we are in Christ we stop boasting well that's not true we begin to really boast in the Lord. Notice, isn't that what he says? Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So, what is this union with Christ? Notice on page three, I've given you a summary of that. Um, And it just talks about our union with Christ. And this is what John Calvin said. Now, remember, we're going to read some verses in just a moment. Um... Uh, I love the very thought that Jesus is in me and I am in Jesus. I love the very thought that I am I am inextricably connected to him. I love the very thought that through the work of the Holy Spirit, and these statements are true of you as well, that his power is flowing through us. We don't live out the Christian life perfectly. Listen to me, we do live out the Christian life powerfully. And that's true because of our union with Christ. 
And so what does that mean? John Calvin said this. Uh, union, uh, John Calvin said that union with Christ has the highest degree of importance. If we're going to ever understand our justification correctly, the highest degree of importance. And John Murray said this, where he wrote concerning the union with Christ, it's the central truth of the whole doctrine of salvation. It's not simply a phrase of the application of redemption. It underlines every aspect of redemption. You know, oftentimes, uh, and I'm one of those, uh, I, I get a magazine called Garden and Gun. Okay, I love, that's just like the, you know, the quintessential southern magazine. And it's all about, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a would-be, wannabe, not very good hunter. And so it's all about guns and, and, and recipes and the South, and it's, it's everything that I relate to, right? Because I view myself as a Southern boy. But you know what? I've been in the faith since 1972. I came to faith as a man was preaching through John 3, Nicodemus, what does it mean to be born again? And Nicodemus asking that question, uh, what does it mean to be born again? And I went up to the preacher that night and I said, I don't know what that statement means, but I know I want it. And I came to faith that night. And my union with Christ began at that moment. And dear friends, I would hope to be able to say to you, I am more of a man that is made, in, not made in the image of God, but more of a man that is reflecting the image of God, made in the image of God, obviously, reflecting the image of God, than I am just a southern boy. Because when we have Jesus living within us, Jesus begins to change everything about us. You see, our union with Christ underlies every single aspect of redemption. Now, let's see if we can't illustrate that just for a moment. Notice the next paragraph. The New Testament uses two interchangeable expressions to describe this union with Christ. And, and one is that we are in Christ. And the other is that Christ is in us. So here's my question. Do you know that, Christ, that we are in Christ this morning? 2 Corinthians 5.17, who has that? Okay, uh, uh, Stephen, stand up and read so everybody can hear you, would you? Sorry. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. Yeah, if anyone is in Christ, we are a new creation. The old is passing away. The new has come. What is that denoting for us? It's the concept of real transformation in our lives. But then notice again, John 15, 4, 5, 6, and 7, Holt. Obviously, this is a passage uh, with um, the vine and the branches, and we are called to abide in Jesus. We are in Christ. We are abiding in him. As a branch draws nourishment from the vine and strength from the vine, so we are, being, we are attached to Christ, and we are drawing strength and nourishment from our Savior, and we're actually living in communion with him. And Jesus is more than just an intellectual concept. He's the Lord and Savior that has captured our hearts. He's more than just a thought on Sunday morning at 11. He's the Lord God of heaven and earth, and he has captured our hearts. And as he has captured our hearts, we long to capture this earth for him. You see that? Ideas have consequences for us. And this idea that we are in Christ is one of the most 
fundamental ideas that you can uh, meditate on and consider all the days of your life. But not only are we in Christ, Christ is in us, Galatians 2.20. Who has that? Yeah, I no, longer, I no longer live. It's Christ who lives in me. And the life I live, I now live by faith. Not in my own ideas. Not in my own considerations. Not in my own agendas. My life is beginning to shift that I want to bring honor and glory to Jesus at all points. Do we do that perfectly? No. But we, do we do that powerfully? Yes. Ephesians 3.17. Did I give that to somebody? Ralph? Okay, read it one more time, Ralph. Yeah. Why does why is Christ in us? Because he wants us to be rooted and grounded in him. What's the source of your identity this morning? Is it that you're just a southern boy? Is it that you're simply a Memphian? Is it that you uh, worked in this place or you've worked in that place? Is it that you're retired now, whatever it is? Is that, is that all that it is? Or would you begin to declare because of the work of the Holy Spirit in you that our identity as godly men is that we are in Christ and that Christ is in us. And that I believe, gentlemen, that as we begin to consider that, who we are, and that this truth of our union with Christ really begins to be our perspective for life and living the rest of our earthly days, then it really will fundamentally shape the words that come out of our mouth, the actions that we do in the dark time at night. It's going to really inform how we deal with one another, love one another, treat one another, pray for one another, encourage one another, and it's going to affect, radically affect, not just um, ourselves individually, but it's going to affect the very nature of the body of Christ at Independent Presbyterian Church. Because there should be no division. Now let's continue. Notice what it says. It says, Hokema says this, Our union with Christ extends all the way from eternity to eternity. Can you imagine that? You know, one of the most precious things that I've understood is that my union with Christ is rooted in eternity, eternity past, right? I love the very thought that and um, of Ephesians 1 where Paul says that uh, before Genesis 1 was ever written, he knew us, he loved us, he chose us that we would be holy and blameless. Before Genesis 1 was ever written, he predestined us in love that we would be conformed to his image. You see, our union with Christ is rooted in divine election, and divine election is just, um, uh, just one, it's, it, it's a remarkable grace uh, that the Father has given to us. But our union with Christ is also the, the basis of the redemptive work of Christ. And we remember what is, what is the, what's the passage in Matthew 1, 21? You will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. We remember that passage with Nicodemus. What does it mean to be born again? You know, the, the, our union with Christ is the basis of his redemptive work for us. And then there's one more, that our actual union with Christ is established with God's people in time. Let me read these at the bottom of page three for you. What are the eight ways um, that, that the union with Christ, um, let me just back up. 
Uh, under the third point, it shows eight ways that salvation from beginning to end is in Christ. Just listen to these. That we are initially united to Christ in our regeneration. That we live out this union through faith. That we are justified in union with Christ. That we are sanctified through our union with Christ. We persevere in life, in the life of faith, in our union with Christ. We are, we are uh, even said to die in Christ. Uh, we shall be raised with Christ. We shall be eternally glorified with Christ. Go to page four, would you? And then Sinclair Ferguson says this, that if we are united to Christ, then we are united to him at all points of his activity on our behalf. Have you ever thought about the ongoing activity of Jesus in your life for your sake? As we are united to Christ, then we are united to him at all points of his activity on our behalf that we share in his death, we share in his resurrection, we share in his ascension, we share in his heavenly session, and we share in, the pro in his promised return. And because of our union with Christ, we have the righteousness of Christ. Ford Williams, a couple of months ago, Ford the second. Uh, said this, that the greatest gift that we have in this life, the greatest gift that we have in this life is the righteousness of Christ in our life. Gentlemen, there is no greater gift that you'll ever receive over the course of your days than the righteousness of Christ in your life. And it's totally a gift. And Tim Keller says this, that because it is the righteousness of Christ, what you have in your life, and if I had you individually, I'd ask you individually, but we can't do that now because of the group. But, but I would ask this question, do you realize, do you know that you have the moral integrity of Christ in your life right now? Do you know that? It's a gift. You already have the moral integrity of Jesus in your life right now. And we know that from, from the passage in 1 Corinthians 5.17. He who knew, knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. You see, this is our identity. This is who the Lord is calling us to be. But we don't understand these things until we understand this union with Christ. And that's why this passage in 1 Corinthians 1.30 is so pivotal for us. Just to read it one more time. And because of him, you are in Christ who became wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that if we boast, we boast in a way that does not bring division, we boast in a way that actually brings unity because we boast only of Jesus. And if I'm going to boast of anything, let me boast of Jesus and let me declare that I'm a sinful man in need of the gospel. Now, I'm on page four of your notes. So, consequently, what does this mean for us? And so I, I've plucked out four verses in these uh, three and a half chapters that I believe pivot um, off of our understanding of our union with Christ. And so the first one uh, is 1 Corinthians 1.18. Let me invite you to turn to 1 Corinthians 1.18. And then we're going to be done in about seven minutes, so you have plenty of small group time. 1 Corinthians 1.18. And the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I, mean, I love this verse. Um, the, the Corinthians had become enamored. You realize this? Because of Alexander the Great uh, and his military conquest, the Corinthians had become enamored with Greek culture. Um, and they become fascinated with that culture but the fruit of that was they became arrogant but they also had a false confidence that's interesting isn't it they became arrogant They're, they had an arrogance that was tied to a false confidence right? 
And so in this passage, Paul is addressing this matter and he is talking about the wisdom and the power of God over and against the wisdom of this world. The wisdom and the power of God over and against the wisdom of this world. Now, what is the wisdom of God? The wisdom of God is this. Uh, remember in Ephesians 5, it says, Do not be drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. That word debauchery in the Greek, um, if you've been in my class, you've heard this illustration before. When I was a kid, my dad got a brand new cutlass. Right? It was gold with a black vinyl top. It, uh, it was the first year, first year of the vinyl top, first year of the 8-track tape player. Yes, Charlie, I'm showing my age. Right? And if you know what I'm talking about, you're, you know, William doesn't know these things because you're too young, William, right? But it was, it was a glorious car. Okay, I, I wrecked it. I totaled it the first night. Okay, it was snowing on a, on a mountain road in, in Virginia. I hit a patch of ice. I lost control, and I put his car in the ditch, and I had to call him and tell him. Bucky said, you said you had one of those too, Bucky? Yeah, well, we should all get together and have a support group. At any rate, um, I'm not over it yet. But, um, but that, that word debauchery means this, the inability to gain traction in life. You see, I hit that ice, and there was an immediate inability to gain traction in life. And so how do you gain traction in life? You gain traction through the filling of the Holy Spirit. Do not be drunk with wine which leads to debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And as we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we are praying for the wisdom of God in our lives. And an Old Testament commentator, Von Rod, said this, um, wisdom, the wisdom of God, is competency for life. It's just competency. There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is factual. Wisdom is the proper use of knowledge. And so we want to be wise men. And this passage in verse 18 talks about the word of the cross is folly uh, to those who are perishing, but to us it is the power of God. And that's therefore, as it says in Romans, we are not ashamed of the gospel because we recognize that it is the power of God unto salvation. Now, we don't understand that power till we understand our union with Christ. We don't understand how that power applies to us until we understand how we are inextricably connected to him. But then secondly, look at the next verse I have for you, and it's actually the verse that we're talking about, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, that Christ is the power of God, that Christ is the wisdom of God. And I, I, I want you to hold on to, to this statement that uh, Pratt has in his uh, study Bible. God's wisdom and power are not abstract forces, but personal qualities that manifest themselves uh, fully in the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, the wisdom of God, the power of God, they're not abstract forces, but they are personal qualities that manifest themselves in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. But look at the next verse. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 7. It says this, But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom from God, which God decreed before the, the ages of our glory. We impart a secret and a hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages of glory. And, and the concept literally is that, that there was a time, particularly in the Old Testament, where God's wisdom was hidden. But dear friends, it's not hidden now. And what you hold in your hands right now is the wisdom of God. I remember being in seminary um, and Kistemarker uh, was my Greek professor and New Testament professor and, 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 and oftentimes when he taught, uh, it, it, was, he, it was oftentimes just very, very devotional. And I remember him speaking one day 
tears coming down his face. And we've been working with, uh, with the scriptures that morning and just saying, do you not realize you have the whole revelation? Do you not realize that you have the very word of God in your hands today and that you know things that Abraham never knew? And so therefore, can I not say that to you? This wisdom is no longer hidden. It's here. And it's just such an incredible gift that the Father has given to you. This word of God, which he decreed before the ages of glory, that we might have this wisdom, that we might understand those things that he is calling us to. Listen to Romans 8, 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Those whom he predestined, he called. Those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. But then notice the next verse. And we'll stop with this one. And I want you to look, go back into your Bibles now and look at 1 Corinthians 3.3. 3. For it, says, for it says this, For you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? Verse 4. For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? And, and so how do we apply this verse? As I've already spoken of this just a few moments ago, there's jealousy, there's strife, and, and when there's jealousy and strife in the body of Christ, what you have oftentimes um, is men and women behaving only in a human way. And when that occurs, gentlemen, verse 1 is true of them. Look at verse 1. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people. Can you imagine Paul saying that to you? Can you imagine Paul showing up right now and saying that to any of us? I cannot address you as spiritual people, but I can address you as people of the flesh, and I can address you as infants. Infants. This passage is not dealing with theological and biblical compromise. So don't go there as an excuse for strife. This passage is dealing with pride and jealousy as the catalyst for division and strife within the body of Christ. Now, you can go there. Um, John Newton wrote this letter uh, it's a very lengthy letter, um, and it's a letter on how we ought to deal with one another as brothers in Christ. And then it's, he continues, and it's a letter of how we ought to deal with unbelievers in our midst when there's struggle and strife. Now, I can't read it because it's four pages, but I'm going to read the, the section where he says, if there's struggle and strife with a brother in Christ, and if he is a believer, this is how you're to deal with him. This is totally pertinent to everything we've talked about this morning. If you count him a believer, though greatly mistaken in the subject of, the, of debate between you, the words of David to Joab concerning Absalom are very applicable. Listen. Listen. Deal gently with him for my sake. Think about people that you struggle with now as I read this. The Lord loves him and bears with him. Therefore, you must not despise him and you must not treat him harshly. 
The Lord bears with you likewise and expects that you should show tenderness to others from a sense of the great forgiveness that you have experienced through the gospel. In a little while, you will meet him in heaven. And he then will be dearer to you than your nearest friend than you have on earth right now. Anticipate that period in your thoughts. That though you may find it necessary to oppose his errors, view him personally as a kindred soul with whom you are happy in Christ to be with him forever and ever and ever. That's what Paul's talking about to dear friends. Lord God, we, we love your wisdom because it's simply not our way. And when we dig into your wisdom, we want it to be our way. Forgive us for a nearsightedness and forgive us for not casting our eyes upon Jesus, the provider, the author, the perfecter of our faith. And Father, uh, I pray for a small group discussion now for the next 15 minutes that, um, Lord, that you'll be in the midst of this discussion and that, Lord, we will, that we will not only wrestle with the scriptures, but in light of the scriptures, we will wrestle with ourselves. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Uh, you got about 14 minutes, and uh, I meant to leave you more time, sorry. And uh, just consider the things that, has been, that have been taught this morning, and I hope these words are an encouragement to you.